Okay, so I make it just past seven o'clock. So I think we'll do some introductions um, while people are still joining. Um, my name is Charlotte McNamara and I'm the head of the health department at the Kennel Club. And um, before we get on to our important speaker of this evening and our um, topic, I just wanted to remind everyone that the Kennel Club has developed its health webinar series so that we can all hear from experts in their field and discuss important health conditions in dogs. We want to share information, learn, discuss and debate and where it's feasible include real life stories. We are not here to offer individual veterinary advice, so we will repeat that, especially through tonight's topic. So we're not here to offer individual veterinary advice. Please do make sure that you're registered with your local vet and please always visit a vet with you have any concerns that you have about your dog at any time. All of our webinars are now available on the Kennel Club YouTube channel. So please do go and take a look. I'll remind you about this again at the end of the webinar. Um, as we'll continue to add content on different topics and we will con continue that into next year. So we're going to welcome questions at the end of the webinar, but I'm now really pleased to introduce Dr. Paul Freeman, specialist in veterinary neurology and principal clinical neurologist at the University of Cambridge. Paul, welcome. I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. And thanks everybody for coming to this webinar. Um, it's uh, it's really a, a pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, just talk to so many of you about this uh, horrible disease. When when I was contacted by the Kennel Club to to see if I'd be willing slash interested to to give a webinar, um, I. I decided to come up with this title, IVDD, The Facts and the Fear, because I just know how uh, much fear this disease causes amongst uh, a lot of people, um, uh, including vets and not just dog owners. Um, so I wanted really to try to allay some of those fears if possible um, and to present you with as many of the facts um, as I can in this uh, hour that we've got coming up or hour and a bit that we've got coming up. So I put together this webinar. Hopefully, it's going to be informative. Hopefully, uh, uh, it'll generate a bit of a bit of discussion um, potentially as well. Um, uh, I've been through it so many times, checked and checked, uh, shown other people, and I've just realised that I've actually got a typo in my own name on the opening slide. So we'll skip straight over that because obviously I can't be trusted uh, to even write my own name properly. But anyway, moving on. This is what we're going to cover tonight. Um, this is what I was sort of asked to cover largely. Um, going to try and make sure that uh, everybody hopefully has a, a clear understanding of what we mean by intervertebral disc disease, um, IVDD. I'm assuming everybody who's joining probably probably knows what IVDD stands for. It's intervertebral disc disease, and I'm going to try and explain that um, as, as clearly as I can. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the what we call clinical signs, the signs and symptoms of IVDD. Obviously, people are very concerned um, to understand what the treatment options are uh, for this disease, for IVDD. So we're going to spend a bit of time talking about the different treatment options and, and try and help you to understand um, the, the pros and cons of the different treatment options. I'm going to spend a short amount of time talking about prevention um, because I think ultimately in the long term uh, you know that's what really we should be aiming for is is trying to to reduce the frequency to reduce the incidence of this disease um, and and hopefully one day to to uh, try to prevent it or even eradicate it but I think we're a long way away from that at the moment and we will talk about the kennel club scoring scheme that's available for for dachshunds at least just to uh, give people an understanding of that and then we're going to touch on a little bit to uh, some of the research that we've been doing here at Cambridge, um, which some of you may have, have read about, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll update you with where we're at with um, what we're doing here at the moment. So moving on, um, I want to start by trying to just make sure everyone understands what intervertebral disc disease is. So we'll start off with this picture of, of the Dachshund. Um, this is not 
uh, all pertaining to dachshunds specifically. Um, intervertebral disc disease can affect pretty much any breed of dog, and uh, we'll come on to that probably more later on. But the dachshund is is the sort of classic model breed um, that suffers with IVDD, and so here we have a, a, a nice um, picture of a miniature dachshund, and I've put alongside it. Um, the vertebral column, a CT scan of part of the vertebral column, which is going to be roughly inside this red circle here. And this is the area that is most commonly affected with intervertebral disc disease. It's called the thoracolumbar junction. And it's basically the junction between the thoracic vertebrae, which are the vertebrae that have the ribs attached to them, which I'm hopefully hoping you can see with my uh, mouse here, and the lumbar vertebrae, which are these ones, um, which are more in this part of the spine here. And most of our cases of IVDD occur in this kind of region around the thoracolumbar junction. And what I want to just show you is that the vertebral column consists of a series of bones, vertebrae, which are joined together by joints. The joints are actually up here. In between each vertebra, there's an intervertebral disc, a disc, okay? First thing to understand is that these discs are fixed very firmly to the bones on each side. This um, terminology of a slipped disc uh, leads people to think that the discs are kind of mobile and can move around in between the vertebrae and, and a slip disc is a potentially a disc that slid out of position. That is completely wrong. The discs are not mobile. The discs are fixed very firmly to the bones. And so there's a disc in between each bone and it's attached for, securely to the bones on each side. The spinal cord runs at about this level inside the bone protected by these bones but it sits just above the, ver the intervertebral discs so the spinal cord you can't see on this picture it's, it'll be inside the bones I'll show you some more pictures later on that will, will illustrate that a bit better but it's the spinal cord sitting above the discs that is the thing that we are worried about that can be damaged by IVDD by a disc um, herniating extruding I'm going to explain all these um, uh, terms to you. Um, but if a disc goes wrong, then it's damaged to the spinal cord and the nerves that leave the spinal cord that we're worried about. So the anatomy of the disc. This, uh, and, and I use various analogies, but basically, if you look at the picture on the left of the screen, this is a, uh, a sort of an image of a, a, of a disc. And just to explain that the disc itself, if you can separate it away from the bones, consists of this outer tough fibrous part called the annulus fibrosus and a lot of people sort of liken that to a car tire and the way that the the fibers in the annulus fibrosus are organized is very similar to a sort of radial car tire so you have this um, tough outer layer and it encases the inner layer which is or the inner material which is called the nucleus pulposus so this part in the middle is called the nucleus pulposus and that part should be high water content, gelatinous, or liquidy material, so that when the disc is in position here, and this this diagram is meant to show the bones on each side and the disc in the in the centre, and then we have these cartilaginous plates that anchor the disc to the bone on each side. So you've got the the annulus fibrosus on the outside, you've got the watery gelatinous nucleus pulposus on the inside and the disc then sitting in position and anchored to the bones on each side. So you've got one of these all the way down the vertebral column in between each vertebra. Another analogy that I think is helpful um, is that of the jam donut. And I use this a lot when I'm explaining discs and disc disease to people, um, owners of dogs, students, whatever. If you think of the disc, the, the, the problem with this analogy is that you then think of a disc as a sort of isolated donor. And I want you to remember it's not. It's held in place. It's stuck in between the, the vertebrae. But the, the jam donut is a good analogy of what the disc is like. It's It's got this kind of outer coating, um, which is 
uh, fibrous, but it's it's got some give in it, a bit of bit of sponginess in it. But then most of the shock absorbing capacity of the disc, because that's what they're there for. It's to enable movement of the spine and, and shock absorbing through the spine when an, a dog or an animal um, is or a human is, is moving in, in normal ways. And so the liquidy jam in the middle is the bit that um, provides most of that sort of shock absorbing. What happens in disc disease usually happens as a result of the disc degenerating, which really means getting old prematurely. Okay, and these discs, and particularly in certain breeds, they they degenerate very prematurely. They get and um, they start to get old. Um, the material in the middle, particularly the jam, it's like as if you you leave a donut sitting out in the sun for a few days. What you find when you go to see it is that the the outer part of the donut has become very stale and and can be quite brittle at the point where you could just push your finger through it. Whereas the jam in the middle, um, if you leave it out in the sun, will become hard and and crusty and and solid. And that's very similar to what happens to the disc as it degenerates over the course of a dog's lifetime. And we know that certain breeds suffer with this much more than others. And um, in, in part, that's because the process of degeneration of the disc happens much more quickly um, in some breeds than others. And in particular, this jam in the middle, the, the liquidy nucleus pulposus, actually turns into a chalky calcified material and we talk about calcification of the disc and that's genuinely what happens you end up with this calcified chalky material and and that then obviously doesn't have such good shock absorbing um, abilities but it also makes the disc prone to rupture so the donut can then burst and some of the jam which by now has become this hard chalky material can escape through the burst donut through the annulus and if it escapes upwards which it normally does because that's the thinner thinnest layer of the annulus then the spinal cord is sitting immediately above that and so it's the escape of that jam through a hole in the donut that then causes damage to the spinal cord a little bit of um, help with the classification of ivdd so intervertebral disc disease comes in a number of different types the one we're mainly concerned about and the one that we're going to talk about and focus on this evening is type one, what's, what's known as type one disc disease or extrusion, disc extrusion. Then this is the type of disease that we see mainly in uh, the Dachshunds, the French Bulldogs, the breeds that are called chondrodystrophic, so-called short-legged breeds. And this is the type of disease that's associated with the degeneration of the disc, the calcification of the nucleus pulposus. Type two disc disease is also known as a disc protrusion. This is the one that we see much more commonly in older dogs, larger breeds, breeds like German Shepherds, Labradors, Dalmatians, various, various of the larger breeds of dog. And this is where the disc gradually bulges out of shape. And it's the bulging that puts pressure on the spinal cord and causes a much, usually much more gradual onset, slow onset of progressive symptoms. Then we have the so-called traumatic disc ruptures, and these are uh, we love acronyms in in veterinary medicine and in neurology in particular. And we have these two acronyms: the ANNPE and the HNPE, and they stand for acute non-degenerate nucleus pulposus extrusion or hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion. I don't want to go into that too much. What you really want to understand with this is that this is where a healthy disc, so a disc that's not degenerate, not calcified, can suddenly burst, can suddenly rupture, usually as a result of trauma. So this often happens with it when an animal is jumping for a ball, playing with a frisbee, that kind of thing. And you'll get a very sudden onset of symptoms. Um, the pain that's associated with that sort of disc rupture rapidly goes away. These become non-painful, but you just have this damage to the spinal cord that's uh, caused by this sudden onset bursting of the disc. This is a very different type of disease to the type 1 IVDD that we're going to spend most of this evening talking about. And I'm not going to say any more about it than that at this stage, but just so that you understand um, the difference. IVDD itself actually covers all the forms of disease, but the one we're going to focus on is the type 1. 
So type one, the extrusion, it's the most common type of disc disease that we see in dogs. And as I said, it's associated with what we call a chondroid degeneration and calcification, particularly of the nucleus pulposus, the central part, the jammy bit of the, of the disc, the jam in the donut. It can present in a very wide range of, of symptoms, and we'll talk about that a little bit more um, as we move through this evening, but very wide range of symptoms from a, a bit of mild, short-lived back pain all the way through to a total irreversible paralysis. The prognosis, and what we mean by prognosis is the chance of recovery. Okay, the prognosis is generally good, and this is something you have to understand. The prognosis is generally good for all but the very most severe presentations of this disease. But there are many, many unanswered questions, particularly around the management of this disease. And I want to touch on this as we move through the presentation this evening. So what is IVDD? Um, I've tried to explain it in words. I've got some diagrams to show you here just to show you the difference between protrusion and extrusion. Now, these are um, pictures of uh, what we call transverse section through the bone. So this is the vertebra. Um, this represents the spinal cord in this little hole in the vertebra here. This part is the disc. OK, the blue is the annulus around the outside. The pink is the nucleus pulposus. So this is what you would look if you sort of sliced through um, at the level of the disc. And this is the protrusion where you get a bulging of the annulus, which squashes the spinal cord. And this usually happens slowly over a period of time. OK, this is the large dog, slow progressive disease that we're not going to dwell on this evening. This is the one we're worried about, the extrusion, and this is where the, the annulus actually ruptures and then this calcified nucleus escapes into the vertebral canal um, where the spinal cord sits and causes damage to the spinal cord. And I want you to understand that the damage to the spinal cord is caused in two ways. Firstly, by the impact of the material hitting the cord, what we call contusion. Maybe best to think of that as almost bruising of the spinal cord. So once this um, material uh, ruptures through the annulus, it hits the spinal cord and causes an immediate onset of bruising, contusion uh, to the spinal cord. But then because this material is, is largely solid and calcified, it can sit there as a lump and squash the spinal cord. And this is an MRI scan, which is taken in the same plane as, as these pictures. And what you can see here, this is the shape of the disc. This is bone, the bone up here. This part here represents the spinal cord. And this big lump of black stuff here is the extrusion. This is the calcified material that's escaped out of the disc and is squashing the spinal cord. And this is what we're looking for when we do an MRI scan. Why does extrusion happen? Well, honestly, we don't know. And that's one of the things we're working very hard on um, at Cambridge to try to understand it a little bit more. But this slide just explains some of the, the things that we think are, are going on. So we know that calcification of the disc um, usually precedes an extrusion. This stands for nucleus pulposus matrix remodeling. Well, the, what that means is that the material inside the nucleus pulposus undergoes a lot of changes associated with the degener degenerative aging process, um, as well as calcification. We know that there's a genetic predisposition to this disease, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Um, there is definitely uh, a genetic tendency towards having this disease or not. And whether the genetics purely is associated with the calcification or not, we're not sure at this stage, but it's, um, it's associated with the disease. Then we think very likely there are biomechanical alterations. So alterations in the ability of the disc to tolerate pressure and, and movement, probably directly associated with the calcification that probably makes the disc um, prone to extrude, to suffer this, this rupture, this extrusion. So now we're going to get on a little bit more. Um, that's, the, that's the really uh, tricky bit to, to try and understand, but hopefully um, I've given you a bit of an understanding of the disease itself there. But now we're going to talk a little bit more about the symptoms 
of IBDD um, and the, what we call the clinical signs. So symptoms can range from pain. As I said, most of these extrusions are painful. I said most of them occur in the middle of the back around the thoracolumbar region, but we also see extrusions in the neck. And some of you may have had um, dogs or own dogs who have had an, an extrusion in the neck. And they can be even more painful, actually, than the ones in the back. I've put abdomen question, question mark here because it's very common, actually, in our experience for um, the pain to be misinterpreted as coming from the abdomen. If you have a dog that has a sudden onset of severe thoracolumbar pain, back pain, what they will tend to do is to present with a hunched posture and a, a guarded abdomen. And um, even for, for uh, skilled veterinary surgeons, it can sometimes be difficult to understand whether the pain is coming from something in the abdomen or coming from the back. And we, you know, we do have to rely on things like understanding what are, what are the chances of this being from the abdomen or from the back. And, and things like the breed and the age, any other symptoms associated with it can, can help to understand that. But it's commonly um, sort of misdiagnosed as abdominal pain, actually, in the early stages sometimes. Often, dogs will adopt an abnormal posture. Kyphosis is what we call the sort of hunchback posture, but also particularly if they have a, a problem in the neck, then they can put, uh, often have their, their head down, a low head posture. Paresis is what we, the word we use to define the weakness, the, the reduction in movement, which is more common in the back legs. Um, and that's then it's known as paraparesis. But paresis is this this weakness that is associated with damage to the spinal cord. Ataxia is the incoordination that's often seen um, in these dogs, again, associated with damage to the spinal cord. Paralysis or plegia is complete loss of movement, as you would understand. And then we often see in the severe cases, incontinence. And this usually presents as an overflowing bladder, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about. So how does pain show itself? Um, this image, um, courtesy of Marianne, um, is, a, is a really classically kyphotic dog. This is a really kyphotic um, dog with, with almost certainly severe thracolumbar pain. Having said that, I want to um, provide a little bit of reassurance. Some dogs that have IVDD in their back and initially present with a pain and a posture that, that they adopt like this, this posture is very difficult for them to, to get rid of sometimes. It doesn't always go away even when the pain is under control. And some dogs are left with a bit of kyphosis even after treatment and after the disc extrusion is resolved. But other symptoms of pain, not wanting to move, not wanting to get out of bed, get down if they're on the sofa, getting down off the sofa, uh, that kind of thing. Not so, saying that I'm encouraging that, but that's uh, a reality. Not wanting to go for a walk. Sometimes the, the pain can be so bad that it'll put them off their food. Definitely, if they're used to going up or down little steps, they won't want to do that. And the change of posture and the change of behavior. And I've got a couple of videos just to show you um, what, what pain can do uh, to animals, actually. Let's go back. Sorry. I don't know why that didn't work. So this is a French bulldog. And Frenchies, unfortunately, suffer with a lot of IVDD um, of the sort we're talking about. And it will do this kind of thing to them. And it will make them do very strange things sometimes. And we uh, have definitely had dogs referred for investigation of what is thought to be seizure activity, fits, um, when actually uh, they're episodes of pain that are causing them to adopt very strange posture or muscle tensing. Um, and, and it can be very difficult to understand sometimes that this is being caused by pain, usually neck pain. And then this little dog I wanted to show you was a dog that came to see us here and, and uh, he had uh, significant thoracolumbar pain and it made him do this. Even though his tail's wagging, you know, you see, you can see his lips are licking. He's he's not sure what's going on. He's really struggling to cope with these episodes of spasmodic pain. And one thing I always explain to the students here at Cambridge is that um, pain associated with neurological disease, spinal pain, nerve root pain, and and IVDD is the the commonest cause of that, is is probably the most severe pain that dogs can suffer with, and. When we hear a dog yelping in pain or crying in pain, 
it's usually associated with neurological disease and it's very often associated with um, intervertebral disc disease. So people talk about grades of intervertebral disc disease, IBDD, and I wanted to explain what the grades mean because this causes a lot of confusion as well. So grade one IBDD is generally accepted as being uh, dogs that have just pain but none of the paresis or ataxia or in coordination or, or loss of movement or change of movement. So the dogs that we um, were talking about previously with the pain symptoms would be classified as grade one. Grade two is what's called ambulatory paraparesis. So this is where a dog is not walking normally. You can see the gait is abnormal, but it's still able to walk. Okay, so this is grade two, ambulatory paraparesis. Grade three is where the paraparesis is so severe that they're not able to walk unaided. So they need a sling or they need some support. They've still got movement in their legs. They have the normal sort of walking movements potentially, but they're not able to walk unaided. Excuse me. Grade four. Uh, my slides are not working properly. Grade four is paraplegia. So grade four is no movement in the back legs. Okay. And grade four is paraplegia where deep pain perception is preserved. And I want to explain that to you. And I'm going to show you a, uh, a video next, which uh, hopefully illustrates that. Deep pain perception, you may have heard this phrase, you may have heard it talked about. This is the ability of the animal to feel a painful stimulus in the affected leg, in the toes specifically. And the reason we test this is because it's the only thing that's really associated with prognosis or chance of recovery. And so if you have an animal that has a thoracolumbar disc extrusion, IVDD in the thoracolumbar region, the middle of the back, and it's grade one, two, three, or four, even four, the chances of recovery are actually very good, very good. And we're talking 80 to 90% chance of recovery, okay? And I'm not gonna go into choice of treatment, whether surgery or, or medical. We believe that actually that holds for both. That's another story which we'll talk about a bit more later. Grade five, however, drops the prognosis to probably around about 50-50. Most people reckon 55% with surgery, something like that. But it drops the prognosis significantly if you have an animal who uh, becomes analgesed, who can't feel a painful sensation in their toes. Understanding this test is very important. We never do this test except in dogs who are actually paralyzed, paraplegic, because if the dog is still walking or even has good movement in the legs but needs support walking, we can be 99.9% .9 sure that the deep pain perception is preserved. So we don't test it because it's not a nice test to do. We only do it in animals that are paraplegic and deep pain uh, and, and have lost movement. And when we're doing the test, we'll start with our fingers because if the animal can, the, the dog can show us that he knows that we're squeezing with fingers, then we don't need to do anything more. But if we don't get any response with fingers, then we use something like a pair of, of forceps to, to um, uh, apply pressure to the toe because we're looking for a behavioral response. So if you notice with this poor little Daxi here, he didn't lift his head. He wasn't sedated, nothing, um, He, but he didn't recognize that I was squashing his toe. And that's deep pain negative, that's grade five. And that's really important to understand. How do we diagnose IVDD? So, Physical and neurological examination are really important. People often ask, you know, how confident can we be of a diagnosis just from a physical examination without an MRI scan, for instance? And we can be in a lot of cases pretty confident, I have to tell you. Plain X-ray. Plain X-ray will not tell you specifically that you have your dog has IVDD, but I'm not someone who says, a plain x-ray is always a waste of time because if you have an x-ray like this one and 
I don't know if you can see that it's a little bit subtle probably, but what we're looking at here on the X-ray, the reason why X-ray won't give you the diagnosis specifically is because the discs themselves are not visible on X-ray, except in a situation like this. Now, if you look at this one, if you look at the width of the disk space there and the width of these disk spaces and then look at this one, you can see that it's narrowed. You can also see that it contains some calcified material and actually you can see the calcified material here. So if the nucleus is calcified, you can sometimes see it with an X-ray and you can sometimes actually make the diagnosis with an X-ray. OK, now I would never recommend using X-ray to diagnose if we're talking about doing surgical treatment. You need to be more certain about the diagnosis than an X-ray will give you. But if finances are limited and you want, uh, yeah, and you, particularly if you have other concerns other than, uh, you know, that this is almost certainly a disc, then actually taking an X-ray may be something to consider. OK, I'm not advocating it as being always something that's necessary, but it may be something to consider in certain situations. In the old days, and I'm old enough to remember this, um, we used to do something called a myelogram, which is basically where you take an X-ray and then you inject a dye into the space that surrounds the spinal cord. So you get this picture like this with the dye outlining the spinal cord and potentially the dye will tell you where the disc extrusion is. OK, this technique, we used to use it all the time. It was the only thing we had. Um, we almost never use it now because it's been superseded by CT scan and MRI scan. An MRI scan is, is probably the gold standard for diagnosing disc extrusions. And what we expect to see with a disc extrusion on an MRI scan is something like this. This is the spinal cord running through here. These are the discs, one there, one there, one there, one there. And they're in varying levels of, of degeneration. But this is the one that's extruded. And this is the big lump of extruded material that is up there and, and potentially squashing the spinal cord. I haven't got a CT to show you. We do use CT sometimes because a lot of these are calcified. CT is a, is a, a form of three dimensional X-ray um, and CT can also be helpful um, in, in diagnosing this. So I want to talk a little bit more about treatment options and treatment options really fall into two categories and that's conservative or surgical. There is a current consensus um, in favor of doing surgery for grades three, four, and five. So that's basically non-ambulatory paraparesis and paraplegia with or without deep pain. So if your animal, um, your dog becomes unable to walk, and we're talking here about the thoracolumbar um, extrusions, then the consensus is that surgery perhaps carries a better uh, outlook than non-surgical or conservative treatment. However, what we do know is that all grades can recover with conservative or medical management, all grades, and that includes grade five. And the prognosis, the only thing that affects the chances of recovery actually is the grade. And it's only having grade five that gives you a less than 80 to 90 percent chance of recovery. And the time it takes a dog to recover from this disease can be very variable, whatever treatment option is chosen. Why do people want to have surgery? Well, there is some experimental evidence that decompression and surgery is in order to decompress the spinal cord. OK, there's some experimental evidence that decompression is important for recovery and spinal cord injury. But I have to tell you, there's a lot of conflicting evidence as to whether it's more effective than alternative treatments. There's a very poor correlation between spinal cord compression and symptoms, and I'll show you some pictures that demonstrate that. Some people will tell you, some neurologists, some specialists will tell you that surgery is likely to lead to a more rapid and maybe a more comp complete improvement than medical management. To be honest, there is little to no evidence to support that, scientific evidence to support that. What we do know is that some dogs managed medically will deteriorate, but then so do some managed surgically as well. And this is what we're always afraid of. But we know that surgery works. And once you've done the MRI and you can see that big extrusion, it's very difficult to resist that. It's very difficult to say we're not going to operate to take that away. 
What does surgery mean? Well, surgery is aimed at decompressing the spinal cord by removing the disc material which is escaped. Okay, that's important to understand. We're only talking about taking away the material that's escaped from the disc, not the whole disc. In the thoracolumbar region, in the middle of the back, we usually do a procedure called a hemilaminectomy. In the neck, we usually do a procedure called a ventral slot. And the reason for the different procedures is purely anatomical. It's just because of the amount of muscle um, and, the, and the approach that's needed to do these two procedures. It's just much easier to do a ventral slot in the neck and much easier to do a hemilaminectomy in the thoracolumbar region. But ultimately, the choice of surgery will depend on the location, the way the disc is extruded or herniated, and the individual surgeon's preference. If you're going to have surgery, you're likely to need to have an MRI or a CT scan, at the very least a myelogram, okay? because it's really important to understand which disc has caused the problem. You cannot do surgery with just an X-ray. Fenestration, I'm going to illustrate later on, but that's an additional procedure that is performed at the same time, usually, as decompressive surgery, particularly in the thoracolumbar region, with the idea that that um, reduces the chances of getting recurrences in the future. So the hemilaminectomy, this is our extrusion picture. This is the material that's squashing the spinal cord. This is what it looks like on the MRI. And this is what a hemilaminectomy does. This is a CT scan. And what we do is we remove the bone here so that we can access the canal and we can remove this material um, with a hemi. This is how it looks on what we call the sagittal MRI. So this is the spinal cord. This is the extruded material. And intraoperatively, this is what we see. There's the spinal cord. And this is this chalky calcified material that can be sitting there like that and, and squashing the spinal cord. Okay. Just a few photographs, um, uh, just to liven up the uh, webinar a little bit, just to show you some some pictures of, of uh, surgery, um, a little video just to show how we actually operate in terms of using this air powered um, burr or drill to remove the bone. Um, and then, sorry, I should have given a, a health warning probably with the, the, the picture here, but um, this is how it looks uh, intraoperatively. The alternative to surgical treatment is what's known as conservative or medical management, non-surgical treatment. Okay, And non-surgical treatment basically consists of rest, pain relief, uh, maybe some physiotherapy and rehabilitation, maybe bladder management, um, and possibly in some cases hydrotherapy. I love this quote from Voltaire um, because I think there's a lot of truth in it sometimes. And uh, I do think that uh, we have to guard against um, the, the, the possibility of doing things because we can do them rather than because they are absolutely necessary. If we're going to go with conservative management, is it worth having an MRI? Well, uh, this is a question for, for discussion, really. At Cambridge, often, if we uh, recommend medical management, we won't recommend an MRI just to confirm the diagnosis because, as I said earlier, we can usually be pretty confident of the diagnosis without the need for an MRI scan. And as soon as you uh, put the animal, the dog, um, under general anaesthetic for an MRI scan. Um, there are risks involved with the anaesthetic. There are costs involved, obviously, with an MRI scan. It's a, a rather expensive procedure, as I'm sure many of you know. And uh, and we won't often recommend an MRI scan unless we have significant doubts about the diagnosis um, or uh, we start conservative medical management and we don't see the response that we're expecting. How long do we need to do cage rest for is a question that honestly, we don't know the answer. I, I read all the forums. I read all the Facebook comments. I see what people people recommend to other people. I, I, I see the comments where my vet told me to rest for this long and other people saying it's not long enough. You need to do longer. And people saying I rested for this long. I rested for this long. The honest factual truth of the matter is nobody really knows how long we need to do uh, rest, proper cage confined rest to allow a disc extrusion to heal. What we do know is that most of the time, if you have a dog that gets worse because they've done too much and they haven't um, allowed the disc to heal, that will happen within the first 10 days. 
We used to think it was up to four weeks, but actually I've seen a lot of evidence from a, from a big paper that's um, about to be published um, where the early recurrences all happened within 10 days. So it may well be that actually the first 10 days to two weeks is the critical time for uh, preventing uh, deterioration, further extrusion of more material, and 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 uh, that's the the critical time. And the reason for cage resting is is just that is to stop more jam leaking out of the donut. Once the hole in the donut has healed, more jam won't leak out. We don't know how long it takes for that to happen. We don't even know if it truly happens. We think the hole plugs with fibrous tissue, but we don't know how well it heals. But we do know it's very uncommon to have a recurrence of extrusion from the same disc, definitely after a month, um, but actually uh, longer than 10 days uh, after 10 days of the initial extrusion. So how long is long enough? We generally recommend the first first week is really critical. First week, really try to limit movement as much as you possibly can. Second week, if things are heading in the right direction and you're seeing improvement, you can probably be a little bit more relaxed, but you still need to rely on cage or pen confinement um, whenever you're not really in control of your dogs moving around. Third and fourth weeks, you can probably start to be a little bit more relaxed and give them a little bit more time out of the cage, again, supervised. Beyond four weeks, Cage rest, in my opinion, is not required in the vast majority of cases. Um, and for anybody who's tried doing cage rest for a prolonged period of time, you know how difficult it is. And, you know, my advice to people always is we, we have to we have to advise our clients our, uh, and the, the pet owners um, in a way that is is doable, is manageable. Um, and uh, this is, is part of the, the, the problem that we have sometimes. Other things that obviously people worry about with medical management, but also with with surgical management, pretty much everything I'm talking to you about with medical management applies to a dog that's had surgery when he comes home after surgery. So things like how do you pick him up? I popped this picture on here from Dodger's List, which is actually uh, there, there's some very useful information out there. I've put um, Marianne Dawn's book, The IBDD Handbook on here, um, and I would encourage any of you to, to get a copy of this if you have a dog that um, suffers with uh, IVDD, unfortunately, there's some really good information in here um, and really uh, a really a helpful practical book. Things like how you pick them up, you know, what what we don't want to do is to overly bend the spine when you're carrying or picking. So keeping the spine as straight as possible is is the key thing. Excuse me. Assisted walking with slings and harnesses, you know, this can be really um, uh, important and, and uh, uh, helpful um, for dogs. And, you know, we use a lot of slings for the thracker lumbar cases, as you'll have seen on some of the, the videos that we've shown already. So sling walking, um, using a harness instead of a neck collar for uh, when you have a cervical disc is probably important, but maybe uh, actually uh, contraindicated perhaps in thracker lumbar cases. But that's uh, another thing that I'm not going to go into right now. But um, definitely slings can be helpful. Going to the toilet is a big issue. If you have a, a dog that's grade four or five, then you can run into this incontinence problem. So just to try and give a few words of, of uh, advice and help with the incontinence. The incontinence is something that happens because the bladder fills up with urine and the dog is not able to, to express or empty the bladder. Um, and what happens is it fills and fills and fills until it starts to overflow and leak. And at that point, it can appear that he or she has had a wee, when in actual fact, what's happened is the bladder has just overflowed and, and leaked. So it's really important that you're shown how to do things like um, helping your dog to go to the toilet, how to express the bladder, how to empty the bladder, because you can help them. And most people, in my experience, do manage to do this um, with a little bit of help and guidance. But you need help from your vet um, in the first instance. Um, Marianne's book contains some good illustrations and help as well. What if they won't tolerate a cage? Well, you've got to come up with some way of confining them for the first, as I say, minimum 10 to 14 days, I would say. And so if they won't tolerate a cage, think about a pen um, or, or some other way. 
Okay, how do we know when surgery is needed? This is where it gets a bit controversial. I want to show you a couple of images. I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, I want to get on to a little bit more of the some of the findings of our research because we're already 45 minutes in and uh, I can talk about discs for a long time as you're probably now starting to realise. These images we've seen already, this is a, a disc extrusion, um, big blob of uh, extruded material there and there. This is a dog that had surgery um, but I don't know, day or two after surgery, probably just starting to, to think about getting around. This one looks pretty much identical, I think you'd agree. Big extrusion, big extrusion here. This dog never lost the ability to walk, never had surgery, made a full and complete recovery without surgery. So why? What, what, what's going on there? The honest truth is, we don't know why, um, uh, and, and we find it difficult to uh, to decide when to recommend surgery and when not to. Um, I'm going to show you some results of um, a trial that we ran here over a period of, of the last couple of years. And what we did was we um, offered for people who were unable to afford um, MRI and surgery, because as I'm sure many of you will know, it's a big cost. Um, we offered them uh, an MRI scan to confirm the diagnosis, um, a little bit of help with medical management, um, not massive help. We didn't have intensive physiotherapy regimes or anything like that. It was it was very basic um, medical management. And we got them back after 12 weeks um, and we repeated the MRI so that we could see what happened to the disc extrusions um over that 12 week period as well as following what happened to the dogs and we only accepted dogs that were grade three four or five so um not able to walk into this and this is the sort of thing that we saw this one here a huge extrusion okay really big extrusion i remember this case he was he was actually grade four um he was completely plegic but he didn't lose his deep pain sensation took him two weeks to even show signs of movement of his legs, but he made a full recovery. And when we got him back at 12 weeks, he was walking almost normally. And when we MRI'd him, this big calcified disc extrusion completely disappeared. This is his spinal cord. You can see the difference between top and bottom. This one here, this is his spinal cord. This was all disc at the first MRI. So we've shown with a lot of cases now that these extrusions can go away on their own. This is what we had with our, we call it the conservative management trial. We had 46 dogs that were grade three and four, so deep pain positive, okay? And one of them died, unfortunately, of other causes, but out of those 46, 44 of them made a full recovery. And what I mean by full recovery, we had a very strict definition of recovery. They had to be able to walk a decent distance without falling over. They weren't necessarily 100% in terms of no uh, mild incoordination, um, but that's what we have to expect and we've come to expect whether we do surgery or not. One of them had no change, um, didn't improve. We also had 18 dogs that were grade five, deep pain negative. Okay, Six of them developed progressive myelomalacia, which I'm going to tell you about. Four of them remained with no change, but eight of them recovered. So that's nearly half of the dogs that were grade five recovered without surgery, which is not something that people thought was really even possible. A couple of videos. This is one of our cases um, relatively early on um, with minimal movement. We've seen this video already. And this is a dog that was grade five just to show you what we mean by recovery. This is proper recovery. This is not spinal walking or, or any of those things. This is proper, proper recovery. So what are we afraid of with IVDD? What is the fear all about? The fear is that a dog that develops IVDD is going to progress to this potentially irreversible deep pain negative grade five state and even worse to progressive myelomalacia. So we operate on them in the hope that we can stop this, but can we stop it? Can we stop it by doing surgery? Can we stop it by doing surgery early enough? Um, does it mean we should operate on every dog just because some dogs will get worse? Or is progression inevitable in some dogs regardless of treatment? And I have to say, I think it is. 
does the timing of surgery matter? Does it matter if we do the surgery um, super quickly? And there, again, there's some experimental evidence and some evidence from human spinal cord injury that timing might be important. Can we prevent deterioration by doing surgery quickly? Well, all the evidence that's come out in dogs recently has shown that timing of surgery has no effect on the outcome, even in grade five deep pain negative dogs. So we really don't think this is an emergency anymore. Progressive myeloma later, I mentioned, this is the really worst uh, effect of disc extrusion. And this can happen usually, it's a thoracolumbar IVDD, these are usually dogs that present with grade five, uh, so deep pain negative. A small proportion of them develop this thing called progressive malacia or cell death in the spinal cord, which creeps up and down the spine. And it leads to a worsening of the signs. So eventually uh, it, you just have the back legs affected, but it can creep up. So the front legs become affected as well as the breathing muscles. It usually occurs within five days of the dog being paralyzed, but it's generally reckoned to be irreversible and it leads to them dying. So we, it, once we recognize that that's happening, we will always recommend euthanasia. Just a word on recurrence. Recurrence is a really big problem. You know, whatever treatment is done, um, a lot of dogs have another episode and it can be as high as, well, we reckon 20 to 25% across the board, but in French bulldogs, there's some evidence that it's even as high as 50%. So 50% of dog of Frenchies that have a disc extrusion are likely to have another one. For many people, a serious recurrence, particularly after they've spent all the money on surgery, um, may lead to a decision to euthanasia for financial reasons. And there's really a huge lack of information and knowledge still amongst many veterinary practitioners regarding treatment options. And I'm afraid that this leads to unnecessary euthanasia in some cases. One way we know that we can reduce the risk of recurrence is to do a surgical procedure called fenestration. And if we're going to do a hemilaminectomy to treat a thoracolumbar extrusion, we here at Cambridge, I will I will always recommend um, to the team here that we do fenestrations and we do fenestrations to try and reduce the risk of future extrusions. I'm not going to explain or dwell on that too long because I am conscious of the time. Just want to tell you about the latest trial that we've started here in Cambridge, which is basically, again, to accept dogs who are acutely unable to walk. Um, we need to see them within 48 hours of becoming unable to walk. We can only take small dogs less than 15 kilos. And what we're doing um, for people who are unable to afford MRI and surgery, we're doing a procedure called chondroitinase injection. And under sedation, and you can see this is case number one here, under sedation, we will um, place needles into four discs usually. And this is a, a fluoroscopy picture. We use fluoroscopy as a specialized form of X-ray uh, to help us guide the needles into the discs. And then we're injecting an enzyme called chondroitinase to be safe and effective um, at uh, helping to digest the calcified and degenerate nucleus pulposus of the disc. And what we're hoping with this is that potentially this could become uh, both a treatment and a prevention and something that would be much more accessible in terms of, of cost. Um, we've done three cases so far. A uh, couple of cases are doing very well. Uh, one unfortunately progressed to um, myelomalacia uh, within a few days of, of presentation, which um, we know can happen, and I don't think we can stop that if it's going to happen. Um, but very pleased to see the first case um, walking at this stage. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're making progress. This is being done in conjunction with the University of Texas in the USA. They started a bit before us. They've done, I think, nearly 20 dogs now um, and are showing very good recovery rates. So it's something that, that um, there is information out there about. Just want to mention the Kennel Club Dachshund Health um, IVDD radiographic screening scheme, which is a scheme that's available um, through many vets. 
where if you're a dachshund owner, um, particularly if you're a dachshund breeder, we would encourage you to have your dog x-rayed. Um, there are subsidies available to try and uh, reduce the cost, which the Kennel Club can um, help with. Um, and it just requires a short sedation to do this. And what happens is you pr we produce a, a series of x-rays and those x-rays are then submitted to a panel of experts um, who will review them and count the number of visibly calcified discs in the spine. It's only a, uh, uh, aimed at dogs between two and four years old. And what we then do with the calcifications is we'll give your dog a grade um, from zero to three. And uh, from the grading, we'll offer advice about breeding. And it's a scheme which has been running uh, particularly in Scandinavian countries for a number of years. And uh, it will only be successful if enough people adopt it, if we get enough dogs being x-rayed. So I just want to, to put that out there for dachshund owners to, to please consider this, um, particularly if you're considering breeding your dog. Genetic testing. I did mention the genetics earlier on. There is um, a gene uh, that's been associated uh, quite convincingly with IBDD, and this is the so-called FGF4 retrogene on chromosome 12. And there is a test available called CDDY, chondrodystrophy CDDY with IVD, IVDD risk. Um, it's a genetic test that's available. Um, and is it worth doing is the question. The problem is this gene, it, we call it fixed in dachshunds. And certainly we know in, in dachshunds in the UK, all of them carry uh, two copies, which is the maximum you, you can of this gene. Um, so it's not a useful test, certainly for dachshund breeders, in terms of um, avoiding breeding from an animal that carries this. Because if we wanted to avoid uh, breeding from uh, dachshunds that carry the FGF4 retrogene, then there wouldn't be any dachshunds left to breed from. We are doing work at Cambridge um, to look into uh, other genetics and uh, we well, I'll have a new PhD student starting in October um, on a project that's supported by the Daxon Breed Council, um, Daxon Health UK, uh, to look into the genetics um, of disc disease further because we feel there must be other genetic risk factors that haven't yet been identified. For other breeds, is it worth doing the CDDY uh, test? Well, honestly, we don't know the full extent of this in all the breeds that are potentially predisposed to um, IVDD. And so I can't give you an honest answer to that question. Um, if you do the test and you find that your dog has one or two copies of the gene, well, what we do know is that unfortunately, they are gonna have a significant risk of going down with IVDD. Further work that we're doing at Cambridge, this work, I've got another PhD student and this work is, is supported by the Dachshund Rescue Charity, Dachshund Rescue UK, who've been very generous with, with supporting us in this work. And we're doing a lot of work to try to uncover the calcification, the degenerative um, process that's going on with the idea that if we can really understand it better, we might be able to do something to stop it. And that's really the, the, the hope and, and the key. And we've, we've um, made quite a bit of progress on this. And what we do with all the dogs that come for us to us for surgery, um, when we remove the disc material from the canal, we keep that material and we use it to, um, uh, to test, to analyze, and we analyze it in various different ways. Uh, and, uh, and we're looking to try to build up a picture of what's happening to the discs as they degenerate and as they calcify and we use these sorry this is going to get very technical for a while but we use these different methods of analyzing the disc material this one uh, is, is the one that we do on all the samples called FTIR which gives us a, a trace that helps us to identify whether there is crystalline calcified material in the disc or not. What we found is that there seems to be a difference between extruded and non-extruded discs. And we, we've developed this, this hypothesis that the, the calcification process is probably a two-stage process. And we're looking into ways of potentially trying to interrupt that process. 
just a couple of fancy pictures to show you some of the the things that we're we're identifying and we're doing. We're using scanning electron microscopy. We're using um, a process called atomic force microscopy, micro indentation. All of these are. Um, uh, very technical uh, methods of analysing this material. So the, the the beauty of this is that we're you know this material that normally would be um, taken and, and just just thrown away basically uh, uh, is is forming the basis of of this research and this work and in hoping and helping to try to uncover what's really going on with disc extrusion. Just to finish up, I just want to show you um, uh, another slide, a little video um, about uh, bladder, uh, what we can do with permanent paralysis and, and, and permanent incontinence. Um, permanent paralysis uh, unfortunately affects some dogs um, that are uh, affected by IVDD. Um, as you know, some of the grade five cases just don't get better. And Bladder management is a big issue uh, with those because, um, you know, if your dog is permanently unable to empty his bladder, then that's really uh, something that that can um, cause a lot of difficulty and, and problems. And there is a procedure um, called a sacral nerve stimulator, which um, a colleague of mine, Nicholas Granger, has, has developed and pioneered in this country, um, which is something that can be implanted into or around the nerves at the base of the spine and connected up to a stimulator um, and what it does is um, when you then um, apply uh, 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 a current to the stimulator um, it actually causes the bladder to uh, contract and and can empty the bladder and i'll just show you this video of uh, one of the dogs that um, nicholas has worked with um, just to show you how this works because i think it's um it's not obviously something that's going to be suitable for every paralyzed dog but in certain situations it might really make management and, and quality of life much better so there is the stimulator working and you can see it doesn't cause him any pain or problems but he's just able to empty his bladder there and i'm going to finish with that um, and just say, uh, really, I want to, to say a big thanks to the team here um, at Cambridge, um, some of them uh, on this photograph here. Um, you see me with my T-shirt that says it's always a disc. This has become a little bit of a, uh, a sort of a catchphrase at, at Cambridge because um, when I'm teaching the students about spinal cord disease, um, you know, I, my catchphrase is it's always a disc because it, it you know, it nearly always is. Uh, and so they bought me a T-shirt with it's always a disc, which I thought I would wear this evening for you. Um, this is Teresa who kicked off uh, the work here uh, as a, my first master's student. This is Sam, um, who was my first PhD student, um, who's just about finished his PhD now, who did all the work with the conservative management um, study. This is Viviana, who um, is my uh, latest PhD student or current PhD student whose work is sponsored by um, uh, the Daxon Rescue Charity um, who's doing all the, the work on the disc samples themselves. So I want to say a huge thank you really to the Kennel Club Charitable Trust, to Daxon Health UK, Daxon Rescue UK, um, BSAVA Pet Savers, the Debs Foundation, the Alice Noakes Trust, all of these charities who um, are funding or have funded um, the work that we're doing here uh, to try to provide more answers and uncover uh, some of the, the, the um, mysteries of IBDD. So I'm going to stop there and hand back over to Charlotte, who is going to try and field some of the many questions that I know were submitted or have been submitted, and I'll see if I can answer them. Hopefully I've answered a lot of them <laughs> through the webinar, but um, I'm sure there'll be plenty more. You definitely have. Um, thank you so much, Paul. So we have had nearly 200 questions before this, this webinar. So I'm going to say straight off the bat that we're not going to be able to answer everybody's questions tonight, but we'll try and get through some. Um, the webinar is going to be on the Kennel Club YouTube channel afterwards. So um, it is available if anybody wants to really watch or share that with anybody. Um, so, OK, quickly to some questions, try and move through them. 
Um, there's been a question about breeds that are predisposed to this condition, and I don't know whether you wanted to say any more about standard or miniature varieties in the case of Dachshunds, or whether there are particular breeds that you feel are predisposed. Okay, so the, the breeds that are most predisposed to this uh, disease that we've been talking about this evening are what called the chondrodystrophic breeds, the short-legged breeds. And the classic ones are the Dachshund, obviously. The French Bulldog is, is very, uh, unfortunately, severely and commonly affected. But it also includes breeds like um, miniature poodles, uh, Shih Tzus, um, what else? Uh, Cocker Spaniels um, are unfortunately quite commonly affected. Um, it, it can affect any breed, but it's it's mainly the short-legged chondrodystrophic breeds. Miniature smooth-haired Dachshunds probably, um, I think, are, are more commonly affected than wire heads, but wire heads are definitely affected. Um, standard Dachshunds are also affected, as well as miniatures. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's a problem in a lot of breeds, but it, it is these chondrodystrophic ones. Um, and that's the, the other genetic test I didn't mention is for chondrodystrophy. So if you want to know if your dog's actually chondrodystrophic, there is a genetic test for that as well. OK, and we also obviously received a lot of questions on genetic tests. Um, mm. And I didn't know whether there was anything else you wanted to add to the information you gave earlier. I mean, I think it's it's we're really not in a position where we can sort of advocate genetic testing as being a good way of um, sort of breathing away from the disease, unfortunately, still at the moment. As I said, it's so it's so highly um, prevalent in most of the breeds that we think suffer with this disease most commonly that it, it's it's not yet a tool that we can really advocate to use uh, to breed away from it. Um, we are planning, as I said, another, uh, I've, I've got another PhD student starting in October. We're planning to do a lot more work on the genetics of this disease over the next few years. And I'm uh, hopeful that we'll have something that will be more useful and, and better. Um, I think for an individual dog or an, an owner of an individual dog to understand whether your dog has the FGF4, I mean, if you have a dachshund, it's definitely not worth doing the test because it will have it. Um, if you have a breed that's not a dachshund, then we don't fully understand the frequency that they're all affected. So maybe there, is, there might be some benefit in doing it. But how you then interpret the results of the test can also be difficult. And, and you know, you would need some some help with that. So I am not currently recommending that people go out and, and get their dogs genetically tested, I have to be honest. Thank you for that. Um, we've had a question about introducing dietary supplements, vitamins, mm. yeah, nutrition and mm. that it plays. I didn't know whether you wanted to add anything on that. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I saw there were quite a few questions about that. And, you know, and again, I read the sort of anecdotal stuff um, as well about it. I, I at the moment, honestly, we don't know, and I, I have to keep apologise for keep saying we don't know because I, I told you I would tell you the facts, and and unfortunately, there's a lot of things we still don't know about this. We don't know if there's a dietary supplement that might make a difference. One of the areas of research that I'm interested in, um, in terms of you know uncovering the mechanism of of degeneration and calcification of the disc, is that there might be something dietary potentially that might slow down or or prevent um, the calcification process, the degenerative process. And um, it's possible uh, in the future, I might be able to give you an answer to that one. But at the moment, there's nothing that we know of nutritionally um, that's known to make a difference uh, in terms of certainly prevention of the disease. And if you have a dog that suffers an extrusion, again, we don't know of anything, any vitamins or minerals that are likely to speed up or change recovery. And testing that would be incredibly, incredibly problematic, actually. OK, thank you. Um, I want to move on to um, many questions about behaviour. So allowing your dogs to jump on and off furniture, stairs, staircases. Yep. Yep. Um, is that it does this increase the risk of IVDD? Um, is there anything that you can do to strengthen the dog um, to help prevent it? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, first of all, 
you know, a lot of people associate the onset of IBDD with the dog doing something, jumping down off a sofa, jumping off furniture, doing something. But many cases are not associated with any known trauma, let's cause it, call it. Um, we don't think that trauma primarily causes disc extrusions. Hopefully you've understood enough from the webinar to understand that the the process of degeneration and calcification is what leads to the disc herniating or extruding um, rather than trauma. Um, it may be that if you've got a disc that's sitting there full of calcified nucleus and your dog then hops down off the sofa, that would be enough to cause that disc to extrude. But probably if it wasn't going to happen then it would have happened next time he runs down the garden or next time he goes for a walk or next time he does something else so probably not caused by um, uh, exercise there is some evidence in fact that um, exercise may be preventative and dogs that exercise more are less likely to suffer an extrusion but the problem with all of these type of evidence is that it's it, there's a lot of sort of anecdote in it. It's a lot of, of um, reporting um, by uh, owners of, of pets. Uh, and, and sometimes that's not necessarily the most reliable form of evidence that we've got. And so it's very difficult to advise. You know, the, the one thing that we know is if your dog suffers an extrusion, you need to wrap them up in cotton wool. You need to confine them for the first probably, as I said, a couple of weeks at least, in order to allow the hole in the annulus to heal and no more nucleus to leak out. That we know, that's super important. Okay. But beyond that, um, and, and in terms of prevention, we don't know um, what to really to advise you. You know, it seems intuitively sensible not to allow a dog that's at high risk of IBDD uh, to run up and down stairs, to jump on and off sofas and things like that. But actually, we don't know whether it makes any difference. That's the honest truth. We don't know. Um, and so I find it hard to come down hard and fast on this and tell people, no, you mustn't allow them to do this. You mustn't allow them to do that. You know, a dog has to be a dog to a certain extent, to my uh, way of thinking. And the whole, uh, you know, rationale behind what we do with IVDD is to try and return them to a good quality of life and a dog has to have a good quality of life otherwise what are we doing with them you could keep them in a cage for the whole of their life to try and prevent them having IVDD is that a sensible thing to do is that a reasonable thing to do of course it's not so I think we just got to use a bit of common sense when it comes to the whole exercise thing um, there's as I said there's very limited evidence um, one way or the other um, the the one fact the one thing that we we know is you've got to be careful for the first couple of weeks after they've had an extrusion. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. Um, so moving on to um, neutering and is there a sex predisposition? So hmm. um, does neutering have an effect and is a dog's or bitches more affected, would you say? Is that okay. relevant? Yeah, again, it's a sort of a fairly hot topic, um, certainly in, in the Dachshund breed, I know um, particularly. Um, this comes from a paper that was published by uh, yeah a, a person I've mentioned already um, this evening in the talk who, who wrote the IVDD book Marianne Dawn um, and she uh, uh, and uh, Ian who's the chair of the Daxon Breed Council looked at um, data from a survey that was carried out into uh, Daxon lifestyles and IVDD and did find some evidence that um, potentially early neutering may be associated with um, development of IVDD. And this has created, uh, you know, this this concern uh, as to whether um, Dachshunds particularly should be neutered at all. And if so, at what stage they should be neutered. I don't really want to enter that debate too strongly, to be honest, mm -hmm. because and I I'm, I'm hope you don't think I'm sitting on the fence with all of this. I'm, I'm trying to just give you the the facts as I know them. The evidence that neutering is associated with disc, so disc extrusion is relatively weak. I'm not saying there's none, but it's relatively weak. Um, it's personally, I think there may be 
uh, something protective in keeping an animal entire um, in terms of the degenerative process of the disc. And, and maybe this applies more to boys than girls, but we don't know. We don't have strong evidence for that. Um, what people are sort of being advised is, is not to, to neuter too early. Um, to allow the animals to reach skeletal maturity, which for a miniature dachshund probably happens around 10, 11 months um, before considering neutering, if they are going to consider. I, I think, to be honest, the whole veterinary profession is having a bit of a debate about neutering right now. And, you know, for many years, the veterinary profession has encouraged pet owners to have their dogs or bitches neutered for primarily for health reasons, um, because it's been shown uh, fairly convincingly that um, you can uh, reduce the incidence of certain cancers, particularly by neutering. But there's now been a little bit of evidence to show that perhaps neutering or early neutering especially might even be associated with certain diseases. IBD is one of them. There are certain cancers as well. And so I think the profession is having a bit of a rethink about the whole neutering process. And I expect people to be doing some work on this. It's not work that I'm going to do. It's not work, work that we're going to do in Cambridge. But I would expect the profession to, to do some work to try to understand better the risks and benefits of neutering. Specifically for IBDD, uh, you know, we have this evidence that has been published that maybe particularly early neutering might be associated with um, uh, IBDD. But like I said, I wouldn't get overly concerned about it. And if you have, if your vet advises neutering for good reasons, then that may outweigh the potential risks associated with it. Okay. Right. So Thanks, I think yeah. it's, it's something that you need to, you know, people should be talking about, people should be thinking about, people shouldn't just be you know, going along and thinking, okay, I have a bitch, it's six months old, it's time to get her spayed or or a male dog, whatever. I think, you know, it, it is something that needs to be thought about um, and the individual risks and benefits weighed up. Thank you. And I wondered whether there was anything else you wanted to say about age. So the onset and when you would, if there's obviously you've explained a lot in the talk this evening, but if you want to say any more about typical age, um, that dogs start yep. to experience the symptoms? Well, I can I can tell you, uh, you know, again, what we know from, from some of the work that we've done here at Cambridge amongst the probably the top three, uh, the breeds that we see it most commonly in um, and, and the sort of age that we tend to see it at. So the, the dogs, the breed that gets it youngest um, is the French Bulldog. And the typical age, the average age for um, IBDD in the French Bulldog is only three years old. Okay. Um, and we've got one in at the moment uh, with us at Cambridge, which is three years old. Um, the typical age for the Dachshund is about five, a little bit older. So um, uh, they, they can get it any really from a year onwards. But most Dachshunds are around that four, five, six years old um, when they suffer their first episode of an extrusion. Cocker Spaniels, even older. Cocker Spaniels, the average age in a Cocker is eight years old. So, so significantly older. And this is what makes us think, or one of the things that makes us think there must be other genetic factors other than the one that we know about um, that probably they all have that's involved in this. Because why should a Frenchie get it at three and a Dachshund get it at five and a Cocker get it at eight? There must be other factors going on that we need to understand and identify. Re very rarely see an extrusion in a dog under a year old. So if you have a dog that's under a year old that suffers with symptoms that you think might be IBDD, it's almost certainly not going to be that. It's going to be something else. That's really helpful. Thank you. And in terms of um, evidence uh, lifestyle wise, does post-pregnancy or whelping, does that have any associated risk with IBDD or is there any evidence or correlation between pregnancy and whelping? No evidence that I know of. Let me put it that way. I I hope I keep up to date with most of the evidence on IVDD, but uh, nothing that I know of. I think you know again, intuitively you would think um, a, a bitch in pup that's carrying the extra weight, that's putting the extra weight on the spine. You know maybe that might be a risk factor, but 
you know, it, it's extremely uncommon to see a pregnant bitch go down with IVDD, actually. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that that may not be a significant risk factor, but we, we don't know is the honest truth. OK, and in, in regards to that, weight wise, does, does mm. weight play a role here? Or body condition? Honest, <laughs> no, no, it's fine. No, no, I wasn't. I was I was taking a sharp intake of breath because, again, it's another question that I have to answer with. Honestly, we don't know. You know, it, there there is there is weak evidence that it probably does play a role that in other words you know the heavier you are the more likely you are to suffer an extrusion what i would say is and i think this is just common sense again if you have an animal that's a, a dog that's significantly overweight or with a, a you know a, a, a too high body condition score if they suffer with an ivdd it's going to be much more difficult for them to recover okay we know how difficult it is for the really heavy um, dogs that go down with IVDD to get back up on their legs and start walking again. And it's just common sense. You know, you you would expect that. You would expect me to say that. And 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 we see it all the time, you know. Um, but it's not that they can't recover. And it's definitely not that, you know, all the dogs that come to us with IVDD are overweight. They're definitely not. Some of them are in really good condition, you know, perfect condition. Yeah. A lot of them are. Um, so again, there's there's some very sort of sketchy evidence that being overweight might play a role, but it's it's not very strong. OK, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask a question now, which I don't know whether you'll be able to answer, but we've had quite <laughs> I haven't a few... been able to answer any yet. <laughs> we've had quite a few questions about personalised physiotherapy post-surgery, generally mm. around physiotherapy and mm -hmm. also um, chiropractic care for dogs. And I don't know okay. what you want to say in this in this area. Okay. okay. As far as chiropractic care is concerned, I don't want to say anything. I have no experience of it. Um, I, I think if you understand uh, hopefully from the, uh, the the way that I have hopefully explained the disease and the progression and the degeneration of the discs, et cetera, et cetera, I find it hard to see uh, a real role for chiropractic, as I understand it, in, in the prevention or, or treatment of um, IVDD. But as I say, I have no experience. Um, I don't want to uh, um, uh, say anything more about that really. In terms of physiotherapy, um, we uh, we have a physiotherapist here at Cambridge now. Um, we uh, we utilise uh, physiotherapy um, in dogs that are recovering from IVDD. I, I keep saying this, but unfortunately it's true, and unfortunately it's true of a lot of things in the veterinary profession. The actual evidence for the benefits of um, physiotherapy and rehabilitation in IVDD is is very poor, very sparse, very thin. I think, you know, anecdotally, if you talk to people and you see um, the potential benefits, you know, most of us would say there probably are some good benefits to having um, some physiotherapy, some rehabilitation from somebody who knows what they're doing. And and I, I'd point you back again to the IVDD handbook that Marianne Dawn published um, for, for more help and advice with that. She's much more experienced in that than I am. Um, what I would say is, and I think, you know, this is one of the things that's important for people. I don't want people to think that if they can't afford physiotherapy, their dog's not going to get better because we've seen loads and loads of dogs get better without um, the help of professional or even non unprofessional physiotherapy. And they definitely can and they do. And uh, all the dogs that we had in our um, conservative trial just had very basic um, physiotherapy and rehab um, uh, uh taught by sam um and uh and, and nothing sp specifically professional so we know that that you can whether you're likely to get better more quickly and more completely if you have a good physiotherapist helping you i think you probably are but you know that's probably as far as i can say
Thank you so much, Paul. I'm going to stop there with questions just because we've covered so much this evening. Um, I think we will definitely be re revisiting this topic with you and possibly expanding into other areas um, with, with specialists who are also part of the neurology development group. I just wanted to say a huge thank you um, from everybody. Um, if you want more information regarding IVDD, we have a lot of information on the Kennel Club website if you search for the Kennel Club IVDD scheme. Um, Daxon Health UK also have an excellent IVDD website dedicated to this condition and dedicated information can be found there and that's Daxon Health UK and if you look for IVDD. Um, remember, please go and look at our webinars um, on the YouTube channel and um, please provide any comments. If you have any feedback, any support or advice um, that you would like, then please all, you can always contact health at the That's health at the And um, please continue to support research. So um, as you can see right through the presentation, the University of Cambridge is branded throughout. Paul has ongoing research and um, you will find links to his pages, which will include in the, the feedback form so you have access to that research. Um, and again, just a big thank you and thank you for everyone to attending this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Charlotte.